Hello, I'm David Hunt and welcome to The Art Hunter. My guest today is an actor, singer, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist. Oh my gosh, uh, yeah, get ready for it. We're going on a roller coaster because she's amazing. Uh, she has a Bachelor of Arts in Musical Theatre, toured Southeast Asia in a couple of um, big profile musicals. On her return to Australia, she's played lead roles in many productions, including, yep, Phantom of the Opera, da da, uh, singing the national <laughs> anthem. It stopped singing, it stopped uh, laughing. You can't laugh <coughs> at this stage. <coughs> they don't know, they don't know you're here. They don't know you're here. Singing the national anthem at uh, the Golden Slipper and NRL's State of Origin. Wow. So we've got to all stand up and sing the national anthem uh, when, when she comes on. As well as forging ahead with her own music featured on a song Bullet uh, by Mog, uh, in, which went top 10 around the world. Got to talk about that. Uh, fast forward to now, and guess what? Have you all heard of Dolly Parton's 9 to 5, the musical? Yep, she plays Dolly Parton. Erin, welcome to the Art Hunter. Thank you so much. Can I get you to just introduce me in rooms wherever <laughs> I go? Thank you. Amazing. Hey, hey how did you go with um, learning the, the whole national anthem? Was it hard or did you know it? Honestly, uh, obviously, like we all have that kind of collective experience of singing in primary school. But when I get nervous, I forget the words. Oh. So I literally, um, because it's so, so much pressure. And if you mess up the words, like Australia will come for you. Mm -hmm. So I did, I did some seminars on mindfulness <laughs> and... And, um, and it really helped me actually because I was so petrified that I was going to forget the word. So yeah. I, I did some seminars and did some internal work and then it all went smoothly. Brilliant. Well, you've got a fantastic voice. So perfect for, for uh, singing the national anthem. Thank you. <laughs> now, where did the interest come with music? Because you're, you're a musician mm -hmm. and uh, you write your own music as well. Mm -hmm. So here you are, musical theatre artist, but you know, like you've got this other career that you could have gone off on, but you're really making a name here for yourself in musical theatre. Yeah. Why? Why did you choose that direction? Um, I started as an instrumentalist. So I was a flautist before I even knew that I could sing, actually. Wow. And wow. then from there, I taught myself how to play piano. Um, and I didn't really know that I could sing until I got cast in a play when I was, uh, I went to a performing arts school uh, for my instruments. And um, I got cast in the, in the school play and I had to sing Puff the Magic Dragon. Oh. Classic. <laughs> Did you know it before? No. You didn't? So no, you so didn't know how song. big it was? No, yeah. no. And I got up at this play and sung the song and, you know, I was eight and <laughs> everyone was crying and I was like, that's either a good thing or a bad <laughs> thing. And um, and one, an opera singer who uh, was the singing teacher at the school took my mum aside and said, hey, I really want to teach your daughter how to sing. I think she's really got something. Wow. And that's how I kind of started doing it. And I think um, obviously like I've always got, um, because I learned so young with the instrumental side, um, I've always got that kicking around and so, um, being able to, you know, self-accompany and do that stuff has really helped me with my theatre mm. career. Like it's really helped mm. play audition songs or whatever. Yeah. So it's all it's all interconnected, but they're all just different facets yeah. of my personality. I think. And and also really good for a singer to be able to read. Music. Oh, absolutely. You know, that it's side it's of it. really helped me because I'm really bad at reading emails in detail. So the amount of auditions that I've gone in, they've been like, and and can you sing the third song? And I've been like. <laughs> There's a third song. So being able to sight sing and just be able to kind of yeah. do that has been yeah. uh, very handy for my um, procrastination and uh, scatterbrained <laughs> personality. <laughs> uh, so you, know, like you, you were over in Southeast Asia mm -hmm. and you played a few major roles over there mm -hmm. and coming back, mm -hmm. um, you know, like your career, have you been really surprised on how your career's just gone? Yes. <laughs> I think um, I could, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I think when you go to drama school, and I was so lucky, I was um, given a full scholarship to study overseas at La Salle. And, you know, you, you, you are so cushioned in a three-year course. It's the same with Whopper and NIDA and things like that. You know, you, you are auditioning with your cohort. You know that you're going to do something in the grad show, but you have no idea what it's going to be like when you go out into the real world, especially yeah. when you study overseas. So when I got back, I really just felt like I know, but I didn't go to WAPA. I didn't kind of know the clicks. So I've just been 
so fortunate to be able to continuously work, which I know is just like such a privilege in our industry. Yeah. And, but you did a, a, a Disney uh, production, a, mm. well, as in a story, mm. um, mm -hmm. with, and Magda was yes. part of Hello. That was my first gig in Australia. So when I got back, yeah, I got cast as Snow White in Snow White, the musical, um, with Magda's advance gig, Cliff Richard, like it was so, uh, Peter Everett, like uh, all these incredible people. Um, and I thought that that was gonna be kind of, I thought, oh, I'm probably gonna play the soprano ingenue. And I just have had a career that has surprised me every gig because yeah. I've played a lot more scream belty rock people or like in a lot more contemporary musicals than I thought when I was studying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then the big one, Phantom of the Opera, mm -hmm. that, um, and you had the female lead mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, again, not a belty. A oh, no. That was, and I feel like that was literally the last time I got to sing soprano. May she rest. But um, yeah, no, that was. Uh, may, she <laughs> may, she, may she rest. Uh, that, that's funny. Do you no. know, but you. you Oh, that will come around again. Uh, oh, it roles. is. There's been there's been two productions. There's a there's one in rehearsals at the. Oh moment. no no, I mean with other shows that oh, you've seen. Oh, I hope so. I yeah. really really hope so because you know I've been lucky when I did We Will Rock You and things like that. That was kind of the the start of screen belting um, eight <laughs> shows a week, and I haven't really stopped since then. But it would be really really nice to kind of get to sing legit again because yeah. that's uh, that's how yeah. I trained, and that's just I, I think there's just something so incredible incredibly beautiful about singing up in that register. Well, you were going to mention there in, in um, rehearsal now for Phantom mm. of the Opera, mm. in, yeah. for Opera Australia, yes. Josh Pitterman sat on that couch a few months back Get doing, it. doing this show. So, And have you met him? Yeah. What a what a great guy he yeah, is! Yeah, so yeah, lovely. Yeah, mm -hmm. so and yeah, like had a great career in musical theatre as yeah. well. Yeah, so, yeah. You've got all the stars. Hey, on the couch. hey, and here you are now. Thank you. Here you are now. <laughs> uh, so. Let, let's fast forward to right this very moment. Mm -hmm. Here you are in this production. Name some of the people who are on stage with you. I've never heard of them, sorry. They're Haven't just a you? cast of up and comers and nobodies. But, <laughs> uh, so uh, I am so, so, so lucky to share the stage with titans of the industry. We've got Marina Pryor. Mm -hmm. We've got Caroline O'Connor, mm -hmm. the incomparable. Eddie Perfect, Casey Donovan. Um, it, just in the leading cast, we've got an incredible ensemble who just make my life such a dream every yeah. time to come to work. But uh, it's just, it's such a supportive cast. Um, I think there are so many different talents that are showcased in this show. And, you know, people like Marina and Caroline, they, they've been... They're, they're just, legends. They're legends. legends. They're yep. legends. And, and just, you know, it never, it never isn't special seeing my name build with them because my respect for them, not only as people, but as artists, is just unparalleled. Yeah. They're incredible. And what, what did you think when all of a sudden, you know, this role and you realised who you were going to be on stage with? You know, like, are, are you now confident with yourself where you went, you know, like, yep, of course I've been invited, or did you go, Gulp, you know oh, what? terrified, terrified. I, uh, it was, you know, I think, I think if you don't have a healthy dose of imposter syndrome as an artist, then I don't know, you had some, a, a great upbringing, but I feel like, um, I feel like it's part, it's part of it. It's, it's because so much of our work is, um, you know, analytical and, and looking at what makes people tick and what makes you feel and, and kind of, uh, dipping a toe in in how to express that or how to express that in a relatable way then um, you know it, it, it has a lot of self-reflection so yeah. you can't help but think oh do I deserve this like am I am I gonna be the weak link I mean I my my creative process is I'm pretty good in auditions rubbish in rehearsals I spend the entire time thinking every single micro expression of the creative panel is them going this girl why um and then as soon as the audience comes I'm like here yeah. we go I know how to sell it yeah. um and that's just kind of been my process my whole career so yeah it was definitely really really daunting exciting of course I was so ex and just it was so incredible to meet them as people when yep. we were doing publicity yep. days and knowing that they're just yeah. such legends and such nice, nice. kind yep. people but then on the other side of it, mm -hmm. apart from you know, the, the cast, mm. the part that you're playing, mm. made famous in the movie Iconic. by the one and only Dolly Parton. Yeah. So, you know, like, 
you know, what pressure did that put on you? Well, I didn't see it to be honest. When oh, when I was okay. when I was auditioning, uh, I uh, my my humour can be quite dark. I can be quite <laughs> self-deprecating. So to literally play the embodiment of bright, bubbly, um, I mean, she's she's whip smart and she is quite self-deprecating, but you know, she's yep. always the first person in the punchline. She's yep. never gonna be the butt of the, uh, of the <laughs> joke, which I love. Um, but I just, I thought, oh, am I a bit too cynical to play Dolly Parton? That's what I really thought. But also I was like, give me this gig though. Yeah, What exactly. a great gig. But, um, but as I, um, as I watched interviews of her, as I kind of, I think, I think honestly, the, the wig and the costume really helped me because I was a li- was much more intimidated until we did those publicity shoots where I had the wig on. And I think if you look yeah. so different to your character, that really helps as an entry yeah. point to kind of slip into it and be like, oh, now I'm her. Yeah. Yeah. And of yeah. course, um, two push-up bras isn't going to go on rise. <laughs> so. Because sitting opposite you, we spoke about this side <laughs> off camera. <laughs> You're Do like, you have to what, wear? What kind of <laughs> contraption is going on? No, um, I, I said that what uh, what they've done with the costuming is really a feat of structural engineering. Um, so I'm really grateful to be able to slip slip into that and then slip it off at the end of the night yeah, because yeah. that is some neck and shoulder pain. Oh right. <laughs> so when I when we started, I was a little bit like, oh god, the weight. But um, now we're here. So, what do you think when you look in that mirror once you're, you're totally uh, dressed as Dolly mm. uh, or that character? Mm. Um, do you think I I don't see myself anymore, or do you think I'm ready? Here um, I go. I think I've got a picture actually of um, Dolly. It's from, I think it's from the 60s. And she's just got this incredible bouffant. She's just got this like, it's this beautiful black and white photo and I take it with me on tour. And I, I don't know why, I just, I love seeing her smiling face, looking up and I'm, and the I'm hair there in the costume. Really high, oh, it's, it? it's huge, it's huge. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that really, I think it's just, uh, it's just really nice because once the wig's on, once the costume's on, I'm, I'm really in show mode. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and so you, you hadn't seen the movie, and that's that's fine. Mm. Uh, and the fact that she wrote the the theme song to on it set on as set, well. yeah, like on her nails, it's incredible. Tell, tell people the story if they don't know it. So um, the the whole story about Nine to Five is really interesting. They actually uh, Patricia Resnick is the screenwriter who also wrote the script for our show, so it's all very interconnected. But um, uh, they the the storyline is actually collections of real stories from secretaries of that time, so right. of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, yeah. um, and just their horror stories of, of their their way that workplaces used to function, and you know some still do, but um, <laughs> that's up for debate, isn't it? Uh, but um, so uh, when Dolly was on set, she got this melody in her head, and and obviously didn't have access to her studio, her guitar. So she just used her acrylic nails and that's where that... Sounds like a typewriter. Yes, because that was the motif in her brain. Yeah. And I mean, we all know Dolly is such a prolific songwriter, but she's also just so, so clever with the way... Obviously, because that song, that song is humongous and it's one of many crazy successful hits yeah. from one person's brain and, yeah. and she does write all her own stuff yeah. which is yeah. you know that's why she's so so successful in such an uh, time. and such and the fact is that she's been doing it as, as you said the 60s or 70s mm, mm. Um, and you know in America she was a big country artist Huge. and now mainstream yeah so uh, you know and the fact that she wrote all the music yeah. for this musical yeah. as well and it really uh, it's a really incredible eclectic mix of styles yeah. like she really transcends different genres there's big Broadway numbers there's uh, there's stuff that I sing from her pop catalogue she's it's really eclectic and it just I think it just shows how multifaceted she is as a songwriter yeah how are you on the women's lib front because it's a real statement isn't it mm. um, you know like uh, for a light-hearted musical mm-hmm. it really pushes home a, a very powerful story yeah I mean I think I think what's good about it is 
uh, for, I mean, it would be remiss of them to not address these issues because that's kind of, um, you know, one of the main themes of the show. But doing it in a musical comedy <laughs> sense, I just think is so clever because so it's also clever. so palatable. <laughs> and as we know, you know, if we're going to talk about women's lib or the patriarch or anything like that, making things palatable, as exhausting as it is, you know, if, you know, it's just very clever to go down that route because it's also universal. The story is not just about, you know, um, women's rights and things like that. It's about three underdogs. It's about it's about anyone who feels othered or it's about anyone who feels like they're being taken advantage of. It's it's a universal story of, you know, David and Goliath. It's, mm. it's kind of, you know, it's just a universal story about the underdog really, you know, what, and it, because it's, you know, a lot of it's fast and a lot of it's fantasy, you know. You know, because it's so, um, it's such physical comedy and it, it is such a trope to be like, oh my gosh, this guy looks ridiculous. And he said, sometimes on a Wednesday, Matt, or something like that when I'm feeling particularly sensitive and I'm up there in the harness and the curtains come up and everyone's like, ah, ha, ha. He's like, sometimes it doesn't feel that great. And I get that and I never really thought of that from a human mm. level because he does such an incredible job at mm. being such an unlikable, terrible, like, I mean, his character doesn't have much, uh, much good, many good qualities for him to mm. fall back on, but he is such a legend as a person mm. and he's so so funny so funny so talented his riffs he changes them mm. up like he's just such an incredibly talented person that like you can't help but kind of love Hayden like <laughs> he's, he's really really clever with that uh, but you're you're the person he picks on more than anyone oh yeah in, in the show Absolutely. as well um, you know like being the secretary he's secretary mm. and and but you're so strong will with mm. it you know like for the the blonde haired mm. big chested mm. you know like the tight outfits mm -hmm. uh but you know like you're, you're real there's real women's lib in mm. in that that persona well i love the the really interesting thing about dora lee is that she really knows how to oil her path so she knows all of his attention she's she's the smartest she's the smartest woman in the room basically she yep. she's she's ahead of the curve she yep. knows she knows what he's doing and yep. she's like that's all right i'll just keep running away and she's just is like but bats him off bats him off bats him off but then when it comes down to uh, uh her finding out that he's been telling everyone they're having an affair yeah, yeah. that's when she's like listen here buddy i've got a gun in my purse i'm not afraid to use it so choose wisely and i just i love i love playing that so much because you just don't ex i love that she is like i don't judge a book by its cover and I, there's so much more to me mm. and i think that's a really great message as well mm. for just anyone in the audience to be like you know at the start you're like oh okay why is she wearing all this she's like i can wear whatever i want and I'll still shoot you, mm. so be careful. Mm. Choose wisely. <laughs> I love now, it. And now we won't say the ending, of what what happens with you no or, or anything, because yeah. yeah, like, and and we're not talking about the opening. No. Uh, which the... which you were surprised that I I, I said that I, I never talk about the opening to anyone yeah. because I think it needs to be a surprise when you go along. It it definitely is an exciting moment. You can hear the audible cheers from the audience, um, and that's how we can kind of gauge how big the house is sometimes when we're on side of stage. <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah, we're good. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I understand why you keep that a surprise. Yeah, uh, and talk about audiences. It's done extremely well, oh, hasn't it? We're so lucky. It's been incredible. We, um, we've had a great run up till now. We extended in Brisbane because um, they, they were really loving it up there. And it's, oh, the State Theatre is such a great theatre. Um, Sound-wise, it's brilliant. It's just in such a nice, Part in Melbourne, and mm. the audiences are just so they're so smart, they're so generous. They've just been really, really incredible down yeah. here. Uh, I was going in the city uh, one day from St Kilda, and I was on the 96 tram, the, the legendary tram mm -hmm. going in the city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, these three women were behind us, and they actually said to somebody else on the tram, We think we've come the wrong way. And uh, and you know, like, and everyone, Melbourne people, all turn around to try to help. We we want to go to the art centre. We're going to see Nine to Five. It was a Saturday afternoon <laughs> matinee, and uh, and that was right behind me. And I went, oh, you're totally going the wrong way. They were coming towards, you know, they they, they oh, were out here. Yeah, they oh, were coming no. out this way. And I said, no, no, you've got to, you know, go, go and catch the other one. And and while we're waiting for the next stop, they said, uh, and I said, and I've seen the show. 
and uh, and then I mention about oh something really special happens at the beginning, and they will country people that come into town on, on a Saturday That's afternoon beautiful. to go to the theatre. They were lost, <laughs> and uh, and you know, I told them what how to how to get there from the tram, mm. and uh, and it was just lovely. It was just you know like it's drawing people from. Um, all over the, the I think place. That's, that's Dolly Parton has that really universal appeal. She's got such a cross section um, of, of fans because because she covers all bases. She's got, you know, you've got your diehard country fans. You've got your kind of new millennials who she's now a kind of pop icon. She's really, really popular in popular culture, like, yeah. you know, memes, you know, internet culture, whatever. But she, she also, um, you know, traditional music like she's she's just so universal so I think that people who aren't theatre audiences necessarily who won't be coming and seeing the Sondheim shows or yep, like the yep. kind of more old school um, cerebral shows uh, they're like oh I love Dolly let's go see 9 to 5 or I loved the film let's go yep. let's go see that and then also you've got your musical theatre audiences who know that they're just in for a great time and mm. it's just like an old school musical comedy yeah. so let's talk let's go back and talk about you as a musician mm -hmm. and you know like do you have any time because you you had that big hit with mm -hmm. with a band? Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Um, oh, so uh, there's actually uh, these two guys, Blair and Marty. They're awesome. They they taught me how to songwrite when I was uh, in high school, and we used to do. So they taught me so much of of just how to structure a song, everything like that. I did some. Uh, session singing with them after high school and then they've gone off their YouTube sensations they run this uh, channel um, it's called Mighty Car Mods if you're into cars you know who they are basically <laughs> um, and they release uh, music to go with their YouTube videos oh, that okay. like that absolutely just decimate the charts whenever they um, have like a, a season finale and they or write, like write that. it themselves yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Right, so okay. um, so Blair kind of got in touch with me because I've done a bunch of stuff for him and um, we recorded this song and then it just blew up um, which was really really cool it was it was really cool also because some of my friends who were really into cars were like I think I heard you in that video I was like yeah that was me but um uh, I've been Obviously, um, songwriting is a skill that um, I've had, you know, since I was in high school and I had a real big fork in the road moment when I was uh, 19 and deciding whether to go the commercial music route and record my EP and do that kind of stuff. Uh, or, and I chose musical theatre at that time because, well, A, you know, you never have to really choose, but to focus on because I really loved the artistry of being able to act and sing at the same time. Um, but I've been writing, you know, the, the whole time oh, and okay. gigging and doing that yep. kind of stuff. And then um, when when the pandemic happened... Um, oh, perfect time. Well, that's what I mean. And that yeah. was really my bread and butter for yeah. a while. I was writing for other artists. Oh, I were was, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Teaching people how to songwrite. Really, because, you know, people went... Online? On, were you doing it online? Yeah, I was doing right. it online. Um, in person for as long as I could because I'm from Sydney. Oh, so okay. we So were, we were a little bit less locked down yeah. uh, for a time. Um, but, um, it, I, you know, I could still do remote sessions and I released um, two songs in the in the pandemic and then, you know, I'm doing, I did some gigs when everything opened up again and um, I got booked to play a festival that didn't go ahead in 2020. Yeah. So your songwriting, you know, because all of a sudden you're in this massive show that's doing so well, 9 to 5, uh, yeah. You know, when do you get? Do you get time? You know, like, do you write any music anymore? Or? Yeah, of course. Um, I am really lucky. I have a piano in my dressing room. Really? So if I put the little practice pedal on, I can actually start. Like, I can play some stuff during the show. I mean, on the like one or two times I'm off stage. But um, <laughs> yeah, because you're on stage pretty much the whole time. Yeah, aren't you? yeah, which is so great because it, it makes it it makes it just go Fly. lightning fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is great. Um, but uh, no, I bring my keys wherever I tour and I've been really, I've got a few gigs um, scattered. I've got one next week and I've got one in the break. Right. And it's um, of, of just where I get to play my own stuff with my right. band, which is super, super, it's just great as an artist to be able yeah. to kind of switch off from one thing and exercise mm. your passion and talent in a different way. Mm. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm always writing when I'm on the road because, mm. you know, creativity, it just doesn't, doesn't usually kind of, it's not static. It doesn't yeah. stop. And what, and what about in, you know, in lockdown? You know, it was, would have been a good escape for you. you know, Absolutely. Like to... Oh, it was my bread and butter in lockdown. Um, I was so fortunate. That's kind of um, when everything got shut down and this tour got postponed, um, I was really able to just 
Um, teach. I taught a lot. I t teach songwriting. Oh, do um, you? Ghost okay. write for different artists. Oh, wow. So help wow. them structure um, structure how to how to write or um, fix melodies and things like that. And then I was able to release my own stuff. Wow. Um, so yeah, available. Spot right. Away. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was really good because I got to kind of step back into that world that you know when you're really busy and doing eight shows a week to motivate yourself to also pursue you know recording every more like idea that you come up with and so it's it's tricky to manage that so it was it was a really nice um nice experience i got i was commissioned um to do a show at darlinghurst theater where i got to just play an hour of my own stuff oh fantastic um, as part of a program there so it was actually the pandemic was a big time for my um solo artist yeah, project brilliant. uh you'd said you've got a piano in your dressing room which is eddie perfect come in and play have you written a song with him i think uh i think it's safe to assume that if i have a piano in my dressing room that eddie perfect has a <laughs> piano in his dressing room do you know what but, i mean but oh yeah, I, I get <laughs> it but but what about writing a song with him i mean let's pitch it come on eddie what are you doing your job <laughs> No, Missy Q's, come to my dressing room. Let's write a song. Yeah, let's write a song. Yeah, let's <laughs> yeah. send him a note. Yeah, let's do it. Hey, Erin, thank you so much for, for being on the show today. Um, and, you know, like, th this show's going to go on forever, isn't it? You know, like, you, I wish. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the dream show for a, a musical theatre person. Honestly, it's it's such a good show. I'm just, whenever ever anyone asks me how it's going, I can genuinely say I'm having the best time. I'm having so much fun. Fantastic. So, yeah. yeah. We're thank playing you. at the Arts Centre too. When? Uh, September September the 18th. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks for, for being on the Thank show today. Thank you so much. You've been watching The Art Hunter. I'm David Hunt, and we'll see you again next week. See ya.